When we're young, we have an amazing, positive outlook about how great life is going to be. But somewhere along the line, we forget to dream and end up settling. Join Up Dots features amazing people who refuse to give up and chose to go after their dreams. This is your blueprint for greatness. So here's your host, live from the back of his garden in the UK, David Ralph. Yes, hello there. Good morning to you all out there in internet land. How are we? This is episode 77 of Join Up Dots. If you're listening live, it's the 14th of July. Hopefully, you're still having a lovely summer and it hasn't been washed out like normal. That's in UK. Everywhere else, you probably have sun 365 days a year, but that's the way that we like it. Just before we go and we launch into today's conversation, I just want to give a couple of shout outs. I want to say, first of all, welcome to Korea. I was amazed this morning when I looked at my globe of listeners and I can now see that Korea have jumped on board. So you're going to get some Korea advice, which is a little pun there for you. Um, and also a big shout out to uh, a friend of mine who's going through a bit of a rough time, but I know he listens to the show literally every day, Tony Bird. Tony, if you're listening to this today, everything's going to go all right for you. If you're gaining anything from the conversations, then if you take action and you focus on the positives, something good will come out. So Tony Bird, I salute you. So let's get on to today's show um, and introduce you to a guest who's a self-confessed creative maverick and believes that there's a better way for us to do things and earn a living. After being in corporate land in the UK for many years working for such companies as Deloitte, he quit his job with the firm intention to never work again. He wanted to create a world that, in the words of Richard Branson, I don't think of work as work and play as play, it's all living. And he is anything but a man of his word, as since then he has written the best-selling book, Screw Work, Let's Play, how to do what you love and get paid for it, and is now working on his second one. And while he isn't pounding away at the keyboard, he's found the time to build his own six-figure business around his programs, including the Screw Work Let's Play 30-Day Challenge, where he has inspired over 300 people around the world to find a money-making idea they love and launch it in 30 days. So let's waste no more time and start joining up dots with the one and only Mr. John Williams. How are you today, John? I'm very good, David. Uh, thank you for inviting me along. It should be it fun. It is going to be fun. We're going to be rocking and rolling. We've we've already had a little bit of a, a kind of rant pre-recording. And uh, I always get a good feeling from somebody when, when they, they like a little bit of a kind of spicy talk before we go. Um, where, whereabouts are you? Because the accent is quite similar to mine. So you're obviously not in Arizona or Bora Bora or anywhere exotic. No, I am English. I was born and bred in the Midlands, in, in the West Midlands, so people say there's a tinge of, of, of Northern or, or Midlander in me, but I live in London now, and I've lived here for quite a while, and I've, I've just moved to Hoxton uh, to a place that's got a fantastic view on the 12th floor out on the whole city of London, and the sun's shining through the windows at the moment, it's, it's very dramatic, so uh, yeah, I'm in, the, I'm in the kind of creative and startup hub of uh, London right now. Are you a, a married man? Do you have kids? Or what, what's this sort of John Williams lifestyle? Uh, no, I'm actually um, free and single at the moment. So um, uh, I've got a, a lot of freedom uh, to do what I want and to, uh, to go where I want, which is quite nice sometimes. How have you managed that, John? I, I, got, I got nailed <laughs> quite early, early doors, and I, I don't even know how to spell freedom, let alone have freedom. So how, how can you do it? Well, there are advantages and disadvantages to both, aren't there? So, <clears throat> you know, it's nice where when you, I was living with someone for a couple of years and uh, before I moved here. And uh, I made nice things about that, obviously. And there's nice things about being on your own sometimes. So I think it's a case of, of uh, find the best of what you've got. And, um, yeah, there are, you know, before you get married and settle down and have children, it, you do have the freedom to do things like go and live anywhere in the world. So I've experimented a bit with that. I've gone and worked, I ran my business from Bali for a month and um, and uh, worked from Italy for six weeks and worked from Australia for six weeks. And uh, that's, I guess, more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult to do when you've got children and that kind of responsibility. I, I love that kind of vibe. It's the kind of Tim Ferriss four-hour work week, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. That you can go where you want, set your laptop. I, I've told this story a couple of times, but it still blows my mind. But I was in Tenerife, and uh, I was on a cliff 
and there was beautiful sea all around, beautiful blue sky. And as I was sitting there in this calf, waiting for my son to come up out of the water because he was having a diving lesson, I looked around and it said free Wi-Fi. And you're on a cliff in a little little shack. Yeah. And I thought, really? It's free Wi-Fi? How does that work? Or Wi-Fi, as they call it out there. They don't, they don't know <laughs> Wi-Fi. And um, I lifted up my laptop and I, was, I logged on. And I thought to myself, this has got to be the future. Why are, <laughs> yeah. are we sitting under fluorescent lights and... And, you know, all those kind of things that you get in an office Mm. when you can sit on a cliff with, you know, the blue waters all the way around you and do just as much work. And I did. I did a hell of a lot of work because there was no one talking to me. And I was just inspired Mm. by the view. Yeah, and I've done that. I recently I went to Morocco for uh, for just a week, actually, recently and could sit there by the by the sea uh, drinking uh, Moroccan coffee and and working on something on the course I had coming up. And it's quite nice be, be sitting in an office. I couldn't, I mean, that's the thing, you know, as, as you said, I used to work in an office, I used to have a conventional job, and uh, I could not bear to go back to an office, to the same office from nine to five. It feels like a prison. And I don't mean this in a way that's, you know, like I don't appreciate what I've got. I do, and I know how frustrating it is when you want to be out of it, if, you, if this is you that's listening. Um, and uh, so I do have sympathy for you, but it, it and it is a wonderful thing. I want to reinforce when you've got complete freedom to go and work in a cafe, um, you know, get sleep during the day, work in the evening. You, you can do it any way around you want and go and work from anywhere in the world. I recommend it. Well, I recommend it too. And if all the listeners are out there, and, and as, as I often say, you know, if you're in a job and you love your job and you love your boss and the people there are great, then good for you. You go in there and you do it better than you possibly could do until you're mm-hmm. over delivering to the customers and, and to your manager and, and everything. But if you're not, now that we've got this square screen that's called the internet in front of us, we have got opportunities like you cannot believe. You've just kind of, as John was saying, yeah. you've got to see the other side. And once you see the other side, and I've now seen the other side, I could never go back. Even if somebody paid me 12 squillion, well, actually, if I paid yeah. me 12 squillion pound, I might go and, and do a bit of work. But I don't think I would. I would say, keep your 12 squillion pound. Mm. I like the fact that I can mow the lawn on a Tuesday morning when everybody else is at work, fitting all my sort of my recording restrictions around around my lawn. That, that, that's the way <laughs> forward, John, do you think? It is. Lawn-based entrepreneurship. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> so, so let's get on to um, your work because I'm interested in, really, I suppose, all the conversations are the leap of faith. So you were at Deloitte, which for people that don't know is like a big auditing company. And even talking to you now, I can't imagine why you would have ever <laughs> been an auditor. <clears throat> I wasn't an auditor, to, to be specific. Um, uh, Deloitte's is famous for, for being an accountancy firm, but it also has a consultancy arm. And my career had actually been in um, software, software for the creative industry. So I'd worked at companies that made special effects software for Disney and people like that. And I worked at Disney for five weeks in, in Los Angeles. And um, I'd also, some people might have heard of the company I worked for. It's called Avid Technology because they were big in the um, online editing world. Um, and I, before that, I worked for a company that made control systems for TV studios. So we went to the BBC and installed things to control the whole of a, of a TV studio. And then I ended up uh, doing video on the internet. So I've had some really exciting jobs, you know, quite good fun. Um, and then I ended, then I got this opportunity uh, given to me to go to Deloitte and, and lead a team of five people to do stuff for media companies, for broadcasters. Um, that was very pioneering. And uh, I wasn't quite prepared for the culture shock of moving from a, a dot-com startup that was very friendly and very creative to a big consultancy that makes billions every year around the globe and is much more conventional. And for some people, that would be their dream job to be at Deloitte. Um, but for me, it was a terrible fit. I mean, you know, you know there were some exciting things about it, but I, I knew I had to get out after a year, so I, I, I quit. And that's when I decided I never want to have a job for the rest of my life. And I've, I've stuck to it and I intend so, not to So what was the that. culture fit, John? What, what was it that didn't fit you? Um, I think it's, you know, it's quite conventional. Um, I'm, I'm interested in a creative environment where people are doing innovative things and they're doing, uh, you know, it doesn't matter what you wear, or what you look like. Um, what matters is what comes out of your brain. And Deloitte is a bit more where you have to turn up at the right time and say the right things and you have to look like you care 
about um, a merger between two giant insurance companies. And whatever I did, I mean, I, did, I mostly stayed in the media kind of area. I was in the media uh, and technology section. But it was still very dull for, for what I've been used to. And that was part of it. I, I can't do something I'm not interested in for an extended period of time. It's, it's, uh, not, it's not a good way to spend your life, I think, which is kind of a theme of my book. Well, I think it's a theme for everyone. I'm, I'm going to play something now, which I've never played on any of the shows, and it's just something that I, I heard the other day, and I thought, wow, this is inspiring. I don't know if you've heard this, John. It was a speech that Jim Carrey did the other day for a university in America for the graduates, and it, um, you can get it on the internet, on YouTube, and it's about 25 minutes long, and as you would expect from Jim Carrey, a lot of it is played for laughs, and he does the speech very well, but there's this 26-second this bit in the middle, which is an absolute powerhouse. Did you, have you heard this, this speech that he did, John? I think I might have seen this recently, but it would be good to hear it again. Well, I'm, yeah, I'm going to play this now, and this is Jim Carrey, and I think this is really saying the words of John Williams. <laughs> My father could have been a great comedian, but he didn't believe that that was possible for him. And so he made a conservative choice. Instead, he got a safe job as an accountant, and when I was 12 years old, he was let go from that safe job, and our family had to do whatever we could to survive. I learned many great lessons from my father, not the least of which was that you can fail at what you don't want, so you might as well take a chance on doing what you love. That is amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, I love that, and I think we've reached a very important point in history, which, is, which, he, which makes what Jim's talking about even more critical. And that's that the safe choice, and this is actually a phrase of Seth Godin's, the marketing guru, the business guru, is that the safe choice is no longer safe. So the idea that going into a career and sticking at it and hoping that they don't fire you or make you redundant um, is not a safe option because things are so tumultuous in the economy. And there really are some very big changes coming to do with globalization. You know, China and India are only really just getting started to have an impact on on the way a lot of people who do um, – you know, uh, very skillful work, um, that impact's only starting to come. So we, we're seeing very, very uh, the simpler work being outsourced to other countries, but we're, we're going to st start seeing more and more really skilled work disappearing to other places where, you know, if someone very smart and very well educated in India or China can do something, even if it's law or medical stuff or whatever it might be, then someone's going to outsource it to there because it will save them some money. So we, we, we're in a very big state of change. And this is why I'm, I firmly believe that the single most important skill you can have right now is to uh, know how to make an idea happen. So how to make a money making idea happen. So that you unplug yourself from the brainwashing we've had, and it is a brainwashing, to be passive worker bots, as I call them, uh, where we're supposed to um, do what our boss says and keep our head down and fit in with the company culture and um, know how to make something happen that you really care about and that can actually make you some money as well and follow through on it because that's a skill that's not taught at school, interestingly enough. It, so it's I hope not that isn't too inflammatory. No, it's <laughs> absolutely. I've I've had quite a few people on the show. Episode eighteen. If you listen to episode eighteen, it was mm. a gentleman called Kenny Felder, and he is um, a teacher of maths in a Virginia um, college or university um, in America, and he was saying that he finds it amazing that universities and colleges have become like a process center where you yeah. basically take people in one end, you push them out the other end. Yes, they've got a certificate. Yes, they've got a graduation. But a lot of the life skills that you need just, just mm. aren't there. Um, my son's 12, and he is going through um, senior school, and it's his first year in senior school, and he goes up to work. Um, to work. It would be nice if he went to work, because mm -hmm. he's a lazy little what's it if he's listening. Um, but he goes every morning, and when he's 13, he's got to choose his options. He's got to choose the, the lessons for his future. And I say to him a lot, you know, Dan, go to school, work as hard as you possibly can, get your education, but I would be wrong to say to you that it's going to be your path now. You know, I think mm. that, as you were saying, if we can inspire the listeners and if we can inspire our children to be more creative and to find a way of making their own money, then 
that is safe that is security and that's yeah. really what i think we need to we need to present to everybody now mm-hmm. you can do it on such a shoestring you might have to work and work and work and work for months and months and months and months on nothing at all but hey you can do that if you're in a job that you don't like instead of coming home and laying on the sofa watching you know the world cup or <laughs> Don't watch the World Cup at the moment. Um, we yeah. don't talk about that, John, do we, us England supporters? <laughs> no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, it's totally <laughs> blank, totally blank from my mind. But, um, you know, do a couple of hours in the evening or get up half hour early and it's these incremental gains. You suddenly think to yourself, blimey, I, I am actually building a business. And once you get a business that you can control, no manager can take it away from you. You know, it's, yeah. it's yours to screw up, basically. And and what you said about uh, the internet changing everything, we kind of everyone goes, yeah, I know that. Yeah, the internet's changed everything. Everything's really, you know, there's all sorts of things you can do now. But I don't think people really know because until you start doing something entrepreneurial, you don't realize, oh wow, I can actually, you know, you've got your own radio show, David. Effectively, you didn't have to ask anyone's permission for that. You just went and did it, and uh, you know, you created this great thing that's got massive momentum. So no one had to, no one could take against you and go, oh, we got enough guys called Dave already doing shows or, you know, we don't like, the, you know, where you come from or anything like that. No one can turn you down. And people haven't quite realized just what is available, that you can you can start a live talk show. You can do a live broadcast from your mobile phone. I just saw yesterday that um, Google Glass is going to ship with an app uh, you can install from live stream where you can do a live video broadcast from your Google Glass. Um, there are, you know, you can publish your own book in an afternoon on Kindle. Uh, and get better royalties than you get from a publisher. You, you, these, there are so many ways of making money. You can go to Etsy and sell your handmade goods um, and set up a shop where there are already people looking for what you're selling. You can go to Meetup if you want to do a, a live event and list something where you can start getting people straight away, particularly if you're in a city like a uh, big city like London or, or somewhere else in the world, uh, and list something and say, I want to get people together who are interested in um, adventure sports or entrepreneurship or creative writing. And you're going to have a whole bunch of people turning up before you know it, turn it into a regular event, start charging them some sum of money, and you've got a little bit of income already. And then you can take that audience and say, hey, would you like to come and do a weekend workshop with me? I'm bringing in some experts who know about this topic or I'm taking us out to do a rally drive or something, whatever your topic is, and charge them some more money. And these things are all available right now. And everyone's sitting at home. You know, we've been given in the Internet the most powerful toolbox in history, a sort of um, a, a box of toys, really, a toy box, I think it has. And we're sitting around, lolling around, I would say, um, just retweeting other people's stuff and sharing jokes on Facebook, which is fine because I like sharing jokes on Facebook as well. But if you're not using it to do something amazing right now, then what an incredible waste. It's like someone handed you an entire robot uh, automated factory and you can make anything and you're sitting there and sort of, you know, copying other people's stuff. <laughs> um, I, I get day. so excited, John, when I, when I Skype. Until I started this show, <laughs> I'd never once Skyped. And... <clears throat> I don't understand the internet. I don't understand what it's doing behind the scenes. But it still makes... It, it blows my mind that I can just click a button and bang, I'm talking to somebody across the world that I've never spoken to. Yeah. And it's not costing me anything. And I've got two screens in front of me. One that's got your picture and one's got the web and it's showing me things that I, I might ask you during the sort of the interview and stuff. But that is just like, you know, that's just a, <laughs> a portal, isn't it? To, to you know, a future... It's and and it takes me back to a location independence thing because I was when I was in Bali for a month uh, we had um, a house uh, my girlfriend at the time we had a house in the middle of a, a field uh, a rice field in Ubud with these incredibly loud frogs outside which would wake us up every morning and uh, and geckos and all sorts of it's incredibly you wouldn't believe how noisy nature is until you immerse yourself in the middle of it I hadn't realised being a city dweller um, but we would sit there and. It, we had good Wi-Fi straight into the house, even though we're in the middle of a rice field. And um, once you've got Wi-Fi, you've got everything you need. If you set your business up the right way, obviously, if you're doing a local, if you're running a cafe, that's more tricky. But um, as long as I've got Skype, I could do video calls. And I did a couple of video interviews with, with a couple of entrepreneurs in London while I was in Bali. I even ran a teleclass with uh, 30 people on it. Um, and you can do all these things sitting outside in the hot weather, uh, with the frogs croaking in the background, and all this stuff is possible. It's quite, uh, it is amazing. <laughs> I heard a fact the other day about frogs, and um, mm-hmm. 
I wasn't expecting you to start talking about frogs, but this is this is a fact. <laughs> but I thought this is this is amazing. If you if, thought if, if only I could get this frog related fact into this show, absolutely. I just hope it gives me a window. And you know, <laughs> unless I interview Kermit, it's not gonna happen. That would be good, mm. wouldn't it? Interviewing Kermit. Oh, hi everybody. That would be a great one. Yeah, that'd be a great one. I'm gonna try and get Kermit on the show. Let's see what we can do. But um I, I heard from my um my son the other day that if you say to anyone what noise does a frog make, it, they go, Rabbit, rabbit. And apparently the only frogs on earth that actually make that noise are the ones in Hollywood, in California. And so oh, when yeah. in all the films, when they needed a frog noise, they would record these frogs going, yeah. rabbit, rabbit. Yeah. And that's it. But now every single frog in the world is going, well, actually, we don't talk that way. That, that's, that's <laughs> only, that's, oh, it's only on the movies. That, that was supposed to be Kermit. That was supposed to be Kermit, John. Was it good? That was good, actually. Yeah, that was pretty good. Um, yeah, so we call geckos geckos because that's like the noise they make. They're quite noisy, these little lizards crawl up the wall in, in Bali. But they think it sounds like toco, so they call them toco yeah, over there. Yeah. Um, I, I, I could talk about frogs all day, but I'm not going to because there's so <laughs> much to talk about. So let's go back to your, you know, your your methodology of Richard Branson. I don't think of work as work and play as play. Mm. It's all living because that's really, you know, what you're about. Um, when you was in Deloitte, and we call this the big dot. You mm. obviously have been in environments that were creative, and then you've suddenly got into this corporate environment that you found oppressive, and so you realise, actually, this is my moment. This is the moment that I've got to make this leap of faith. Yeah. How scared were you at that moment when you walked out on this probably high-paying job, there was mm. a certain amount of security, and you were going to go into a world where you wanted to play every day? Well, I, um, <clears throat> it was a high-paying job, and um, uh, it was very scary, but I thought, I just have to get out of here because uh, uh, I, I'm very aware that we don't know how long we've got to live. My father died when he was 34 in a car accident, and I think that's coloured my whole life, so it's made me think all the time that I don't know when I could go. And I'm always been surprised and rather shocked by people who just go, you, you, when you mention death, they'll talk about dying in their sleep at 80. And you go, well, that's a nice idea. But I mean, just, they, they're so convinced of it. You, they give this little dreamy, nice look in their face about this is how they're going to die. And I think, well, well, I hope so. But, um, uh, but, it, but it might not be, it might be next year. And um, uh, so with that knowledge that it could be any time, does it make sense to spend, I'd spent a, a year in Deloitte and learned some interesting things, but does it make sense to spend another year doing something I, I really don't enjoy and doesn't fit when I have so much passion for other stuff? And what I did was I decided I had to quit. And um, to force my hand, there's something rather bizarre that did terrify me, which is I signed on to a psychotherapy training course, um, a one-year course to, to um, that's the beginning of a psychotherapy training. And it takes 35 days <clears throat> across the course of the year. And I didn't have enough leave to do that. So I signed on to a course I actually couldn't do in my job. And then one, once they accepted me, I went to the company and said, look, I want to go. And what I'd like you to do is give me um, my notice period, which is three months, and let me go. And that would be my – I'd be very happy if you could do that. And there are certain reasons why I thought that was quite a good – quite a reasonable thing to ask um, – uh, because of the, the the way things have been going in the company and some people being let go at the time anyway. So I thought, you know, that's that that would help me get on get on the way. And um and they uh fortunately they agreed to let me go. Um and uh I went and did the course. So I started psychotherapy training. And then what I did and I described this in my book, what I did was I, I my plan was to go and do um uh, well, actually, I'll tell you the big dot moment was when I, they called me into a meeting. They said, this is what we decide about you leaving. This is what you're going to get uh, um, uh, as you leave, uh, some money. And um, and, and I, I went, OK. And they said, you go and think about it. And I walked out of that room and I thought, wow, I'm actually going to do this. You know, that was a really exciting <laughs> moment. Uh, it was a little bit scary as well, but exciting. And... So I was on the course, but what I also did is I thought, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and do what I do at Deloitte, which is consult on technical strategy for the BBC and broadcasters like that, and do it as an individual. And if I can charge twice as much as my as I make per day in my job, then I can take half my time off, do psychotherapy training, and develop whatever it is I'm going to do next, as I had no idea at that point. 
And um, in actual fact, I ended up very quickly after maybe that my well, what what happened was I called everyone I knew, and I decided very specifically, and this is uh, an important piece of advice for people who want to make this transition. I didn't call anybody and everybody. I decided I wanted a project at the BBC for multiple reasons. One, they're very prestigious, so it looked great on my on my CV. Two, uh, they were doing some very innovative work around um, TV technology at the time and about managing uh, video content. And three, I had some contacts in there already. So I thought, I'm just going to phone everybody and anybody in the BBC or around the BBC until I get a project in there. I know I can get one and they can pay me independently. And I called people I saw, uh, people I knew from the BBC, people who were selling into the BBC, people who were consulting to the BBC. And I even cold called people I saw listed in Broadcast Magazine, which is the trade paper, um, who said they were, t who were talking about projects that they were doing in the BBC. And after three months, absolutely nothing had happened whatsoever. And uh, I had still had no money coming in. And then finally, I got a call one morning from somebody who said, um, I was asleep at the time, actually, and uh, I woke up a bit drowsy, and someone said, hi, um, this is so-and-so uh, from BBC Broadcast. We wondered if you'd like to come in for an interview. So I went in for an interview, and um, they hired me, and I started on Monday at uh, a pretty good rate. I think it was £600 a day or something, and did that for a, a couple of months. So that was my first project under my belt. It was quite an interesting one. It was a pr multi-million pound project that I was um, involved in. Can, and I, then, can I just take you back to those three months when you weren't yeah, getting yeah. any money in? Sure. What, what, was <laughs> what was going through your mind? Did, did you ever have a moment of going, oh, I'm just going to phone Deloitte and say, I've had a mental breakdown and it's, I, I need to come back? Did you have any... Oh, no. You never no, thought about going back? No, I mean, I got scared, but um, no... No, and that's, I don't think that's ever really occurred to me. Um, I do have, I'm not, I'm not a particularly confident person in, in a lot of ways, but uh, when I know something's right, I tend to stick to it. And I've, and I've held out before, in fact, before this, I'd been through the mill because I'd, I'd wanted to work three days a week as a freelancer and, and had a, um, I was really running out of money. I uh, spent six months trying to trying to go freelance. This is before I learned everything I know now about how to market myself. And um, and I'd learned it in the process of doing this. And after six months, I was running out of money. So this is before I met, went to Deloitte. Um, and somebody offered me a full-time job at an internet consultancy that was a really exciting job. And I just turned them down point, point blank and said, no, I'll only take three days a week as a freelancer. And eventually, he um, he just said no way to that. And eventually, he caved and hired me three days a week uh, for a year, and I did a really exciting job. I did actually go full-time for a year after that. But holding out, somehow I just knew it was right to hold out at that point and, and to have some time available. And the same thing with Deloitte. I just knew it was right to hold out somehow. So you really had faith, and, and you, you just trusted that something in the universe was going to come good for you? No, I think I was terrified. But I thought if I, if I keep phoning people... Um, and because I'm not an optimist, particularly, I'm a, I'm a bit of a pessimist. Um, I wish I was an optimist, but I, but I'm not. And uh, and I just thought if I could keep finding enough people, I knew there were projects going on. My essential logic was sound, which is that Deloitte are very expensive to hire. So my daily rate at Deloitte was on on the card anyway, three thousand pounds a day, and this is ten years ago. So you, technically, you should be paying me three thousand pounds a day to have me on a project through Deloitte. Now. Most people, because this technology was very early, it was clearly going to explode and become massive. It was about how to manage massive uh, libraries of millions of hours of video. Uh, it was going to become huge, but it was so early that no one wanted to pay Deloitte a million pounds for a basic project. But they, even if they paid me half the Deloitte rate, they would be um, uh, getting a bargain and I would be getting a lot compared to my salary. So that's what I ended up doing in the end so I, the fundamental that fundamental assumption proved to be true that people did want to do this work they didn't want to pay Deloitte's rates and they were happy to to pay for me and that's how it worked and then the second project I got after the BBC they said uh, that someone called me up and said hey we heard you're a broadcast consultant in this area um, we've got n we, we're working a two billion pound project we have no broadcast expertise whatsoever and we need you to start tomorrow what is your rate 
And by the way, if you're ever negotiating someone's rate, ching. yeah, that's how not to do it. <laughs> oh, is, is it? Is it not? I, I would have gone right. Okay, let's put an extra <laughs> note on there. Oh, and another no, note. It, it, for them though, it's the wrong thing to say because of course I doubled my rate immediately. Yeah. So um, and I then they I said yes straight away, and I bet you think, oh, I should have trebled it. I know. Uh, no, they did gulp. I actually said, and, and one of the great strengths of uh, one of the great skills of of making really good money is the ability to say your rate. Uh, with a straight face. <laughs> Fortunately, I was on the phone with this person. But honestly, if you ever, if you uh, have problems saying it doesn't matter if it's a uh, eleven hundred pounds a day, three thousand pounds a day, or or, or three hundred pounds a day, it, it, the same anxieties come out uh, for everyone. So you need to stand in front of a mirror and practice saying I cost three hundred pounds a day, or fifty pounds an hour, or eleven hundred pounds an hour, whatever the figure is. It doesn't matter. Whatever's shocking for you. You need to practice saying that until you can do it and feel like that's normal. So when this guy said, how much is your rate? And I thought, it's got to be at least 1,000, but I can't say 1,000 because it sounds like a round number. So I'll say uh, 1,100. And he says, does that include VAT? I went, no, VAT's on top of that. And he went, okay. And uh, he kind of swallowed, I think, briefly. And um, and then I started a few days later on this project and, and it ended up making – something like a hundred thousand pounds out of out of that project and related projects that followed on from it and other work around around that area um and then eventually it was time to move on and do what i really wanted to do so it's a whole different story again <laughs> episode 30 no I, where, where are you again <laughs> well we'll have you as a weekly guest um but it's a, <laughs> it's a key point what you're making there that we all of us, we undervalue our own talents, aren't we? Especially when you're going into the entrepreneurial world and you are reaching out to people and people are buying your services. There's a kind of limiting belief that we all have that actually no one's going to buy this. But they do because they need it. And I've, I've, I've based my whole life as a, as a trainer. I used to be up in the city of London doing training courses. And quite often, as I used to say to people, I was one page ahead of them but with, yeah. conf with confidence. So I could stand <coughs> up there and I could talk with all the confidence in the world and that gave me 90% of my authority and the other 10% was a was knowledge that I, I clued up on the night before, before I'd yeah. actually done it. the rest that. you could Google. <clears throat> yeah, I had a friend who, who got a job in, a, in, in the special effects industry and was supposed to be training people in a very complicated piece of special effects software. And she would go out for the first few meetings and she didn't know the software very well. And they would say things like, um, uh, oh, I'm trying to, you know, I'm working on this feature film and I'm trying to grade the whole thing to make it this color and, and I'm having a problem with the luminance. Do you know why that is? And she'd go, good question. I'm just going to go and get, uh, get a drink and I'll come back and I'll answer that. And she went outside went onto a forum for her own product, posted the question, <laughs> went, went and got a drink, came back, usually got the answer in time, and would go in and go, yes, I think what you'll find is uh, you can't reduce the luminance unless you up your key first or something like that. It's brilliant, isn't it? Still, which is a terrifying way to live, but it only lasted for a while, and now she's actually still in the same job. Um, uh, she, she's now, of course, a world expert in this topic. So it, it, blagging is part of the game. You want to. You don't want to be blagging if you're a you know a pilot or a, or a neurosurgeon. But for for consultancy and and many of the other things that we do, it's entirely valid because you can usually go and learn as long as you're willing to put in the work to learn the stuff um, to fill in the gaps. That would be terrible if you had an airline pilot that blagged, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just go. Oh right, storm. Uh, let me just Google how to fly through a storm. <laughs> Hello, this is John. We're going to be flying at 40,000 feet. Uh, this is the first time I've ever done this, but uh, I, I, I that think no. that would be fun, though, wouldn't it, if you were an airline pilot? That would be fun to say over the, uh, over the tannoy, that's for sure. Yeah. Right, OK, what I'm going to do now, John, I, I want to bring on Steve Jobs because it is really the sort of the moment of the show that links everything together. And this is a speech that he did back in 2005, and he's got great resonance to most people um i'm going to play it and then i'm going to ask your feelings on this and whether you remember when you first heard it and whether it has yeah. played a part in your life so this is steve jobs of course it was impossible to connect the dots looking forward when i was in college but it was very very clear looking backwards 10 years later again you can't connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking backwards so you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something. 
your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart even when it leads you off the well-worn path. And that will make all the difference. What do you reckon, Mr. Williams? Well, I'm, I, you know, that speech was a big inspiration. When I was writing my book in 2009, it, it captured the whole, pretty much everything he said in the speech was was at the heart of what I was writing about. And he writes very, elo- he speaks very eloquently about death at that time. And, uh, and I quoted that as well, which is, I think is a big part of, as I've said, about remembering you're going to die, I think his phrase is, remembering I'm going to die is the best tool I know for keeping me on track or some worse to that effect. Um, so, yeah, and, and what I'm teaching in my courses now, um, you know, when I made this second shift into helping people do what they love and get paid for it, the big programs I run, I'm running one at the moment with 300 people on it uh, around the world. We, we do this twice a year. It's called the, the 30-day challenge. And um, w- one of the key principles is to, at the beginning, don't wait to find your passion because that's one of the mistakes people think. Uh, but they, they shouldn't do anything until they found their passion. You have to you find your passion by playing it out. What you do in the early stages is you follow the energy. So what the stuff that excites you and energizes you right now, if you, if you follow that path, which evolves as, you, as time goes on, because once you've got into one topic, then you get into another, then that will take you somewhere useful and interesting. And the... I suppose what connects the dots actually is you. It's the development of you and the and the and the growth of you from who you were at the beginning to who you're going to become. And you can't know who that is until you start doing this process, until you start playing it out. Mm. And so that's what we're saying. We say, you know, the, when you're trying to find the thing that's going to make you a millionaire or make you incredibly um, happy and, and whatever else, you start with square one is what energizes me. What excites me right now? And there may be a whole bunch of things that excite you and you need to combine them all or you take one of them in particular and you take that one forward. But you just start with anything if necessary, anything that excites you. And I think that's the part when I think of the... If you've seen the graphic by Dimitri Martin, which is what people thinks, how people think success works, which is a straight line from A to B, and then there's how success really works. Yeah. And in between the A and B, there's a massive great squiggle that looks like a tumbled cable. Uh, it's completely insane. And that's what really happens. So you start out and you just follow your nose. And uh, at each step, you work out where to go next. And then you end up somewhere really exciting. And I, people, I, for some reason, doesn't, don't think it works like that. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I'm going to be on a show next week called Zen People, I believe it's called. Um, It's a chap Mm. in Los Angeles. And we're actually going to be discussing the fact that we benchmark ourselves against success and it stops us doing anything. And really, it's those incremental gains. It's those leaps of faith. It's all those things that aren't sexy so we don't hear them in in the show highlights that actually get you to the level of success. And as you say, yeah. we all want to have that straight line. Um, in this show, you know, I've done 100 shows now, and the first maybe 30 was adrenaline. I didn't know what I was yeah. doing, and I was just kind of pressing record, hoping it was doing it, trying to think of things to say. Then I think the next 30, I think I started to hopefully not dip, but I became a little bit comfortable. But mm. now I, I actually feel myself really excited. I hopefully it comes out on the mm. mic. You know, yeah, when, yeah. when I think to myself, I'm speaking to John Williams today and I've got some guests lined up that are amazing. And when I started at the beginning, I couldn't even comprehend how I would get guests like this on the show. And then people are coming to me now and I'm thinking, this is even better. And some of these people I've never heard of. And then I do a bit sort of stalking and sort of reading their backgrounds. And I think, wow. This is a conversation and it just yeah. moves you on. It moves you on, moves you on. And I yeah. am so excited about seeing where this thing can go because I just can't get enough of it. It's like, I, I, I'll be honest, last night I went out and I had too many beers. I, I met <laughs> a, a friend that I haven't met for a long time. We had too many beers and maybe half hour before we started recording, I was thinking to myself, this is a bad idea. I shouldn't have drunk that much last night. I'm going to come over a bit low key. But as soon as you press record and the conversations and the powerhouse information that you're giving our listeners, you can't help mm. being infused, can you? You, you? you feel like yeah. running around your garden shouting, we have got a future. You just need to get out there and take action. Yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, and I've, um, I, I'm myself run, running out of steam because I've been running this course with 300 people on it. And it's the 30 day challenge started on the uh, um, 26 days ago. So it's got four days left to run. And, um, uh, and, and, and yet every time I wake up and I see what they're doing and what's happening and the process they're going through, it's so entertaining, it's so exciting. And to see what they're creating. So the idea of the 30 day challenge is people, um, come up with an idea and make it happen in 30 days. So uh, I know what you mean about you, you might wake up a bit tired and then you, you start doing the thing that is your work and uh, and it re-energizes you. And I can certainly hear it in, in, in you. I think you're brilliant at this, but like... Oh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that because this is my dot. This is where I, we were saying just before we were recording. When you're looking for your passion, and it's one of those things mm. that you read in these self-help books find your passion in life and you almost want to punch someone in the face because they never tell you yeah. what your passion is and they go well, <laughs> when you find it you will know and it's very zen and you you think well how am i going to find it because i'm going to work nine five days a week till nine to five yeah. and when i get home i'm so tired from doing this job for five days that i don't really like doing but it's paying the bills the last thing I, what i want to do is find my passion now the horrible mm. thing about it is when you do find your passion, you understand exactly what all these people are saying because it's, it's yeah. the thing that's in you. And the tagline to our show is connecting our past by building our future. And one of the themes, mm. John, that has come out more and more and more is if you go back to the childhood John Williams, the things that yeah. you loved doing. You know, I bet you were somebody that liked getting friends together and making clubs and, and creating mm. things and, and writing. And I bet all those things. Yeah. Then you go to work and forget all about it because you just mm. get a job and you move into a career that, if you be honest, it's not really your passion, but it just pays well. But mm. every single guest has almost said, yeah, when I found my thing, the thing that really has taken me on, the thing that is my unique path, it is the things that I used to do when I was little and naturally was good at them. So didn't think that they were worthy of having a, a career based around it. Yeah. Yeah. And I've recently been interviewing some entrepreneurs who are absolutely fascinating. Some of whom have done my courses um, um and uh, some of them, some of their careers are so obscure. Uh, Lizzie Ostrom, who um, runs perfume events and scent events in London, and she has themed nights where you come along with scratch and sniff cards, or or you um, have perfumes on a certain uh, theme, and smell them and talk about them. Someone gives a talk and there are drinks and stuff. So social events, and then she also does those for corporates and the. Um, the public events get a lot of PR and that helps support the corporate people coming to her and paying really good money for similarly themed events. And I also had a guy called Chris Wyatt who had coached with me a long time ago and uh, he runs a blog called uh, retronaut.com which, which has these amazing images that bring history to life. I mean, if you think history is boring, go and look at retronaut.com because he shows you the images and make you think, oh wait. This isn't some black and white thing that I can't relate to. This is like, oh, these people are really real. And he's done something very unique and very subtle, which is a, a piece of genius. And it came out of, this is a really interesting thing. It came out of the fact that he said, um, he, when, he, when he kept going to, back to that classic careers coaching question, which I often ask people, which is, you know, what, what, what would you do if you could do anything? If, if the, all practicalities aside, he said, I would go back in time. He always wanted to be able to travel through time. And you can't get more impractical than that, you know, breaking the laws of physics. So he discarded that again and again and again. And then eventually he said, well, you know, no, this really is what I want to do. This is the thing I'd most like. So what can I do that gets me as close as possible to that? And what he came up with was, a ret uh, was the Retronaut, um, which now gets 50,000 hits a day. He's got a book deal with National Geographic coming out in September. He's um, He's been on radio and he's been recommended by all the big papers in the UK. He's been interviewed all over the world. He's got all sorts of famous people <laughs> involved in his startup. And, um, and it's all come out of the fact that he didn't give up on this idea that um, the thing he really wanted to do is travel in time. So if you've got an impossible thing like that, the question you ask yourself is, uh, I like the author Barbara Scher, and she has a question which is, what's the part that you love most about this dream? 
And so when he thought about the part that, that he loved most, I don't, haven't heard him answer this question specifically, but it would be something around experiencing the past as if it's right here, right now. And that's what he brought out in his blog. And that's what resonated with so many people around the world. So that's the question for everyone. If you think your dream is impossible, and often it isn't um, as impossible as you think, but if it really is something like Chris's, then you can ask, what's the part that excites me most? And how can I get just that part that excites me? So if you want to be a billionaire like Richard Branson, you go, okay, that's going to take a lifetime if, if you can do it at all. But if you ask what really excites me, if it's living on an island, you know, in the middle of the the, the Virgin Islands or wherever it is, then um, you that is actually possible. You can go and do that without being a billionaire. If it's um, to create something really innovative in business that people absolutely love, you can do that. You can start today. So you've got to find out the part that excites you and then start building on that. And the point of my programs is to is to really bring people down to what can you, I mean, it sounds crazy, but what can you do in 30 days? So my model is if you want to find your passion or if you want to make a living doing what you love, what you do is you find the nub of what you want to do and say, what can I create in 30 days and release to the world and share with everyone and then look at it and then I, then I iterate, which is a word from the startup world. So what that means is if you say, okay, the heart of this, um, uh, for instance, for Chris, the blog was um, the first thing he did was he created a blog, a simple blog in WordPress and put some of these images up that he'd shown friends and his friends went, wow, these are really interesting. And so he just put those up and put it out into the world. Then he sat back and thought, okay, what do I do now? Okay, the site needs to be better. Or I need more of this kind of image. Or I need some video or whatever it might be. And he goes and does it again and releases it and sees what people make of it. So this process of playing in public, as I refer to it, is absolutely essential. What we tend to do is we sit around reading and thinking and musing and drawing bits on bits of paper. We don't create anything. We don't put anything out into the world. And we don't get any feedback. So you've got to go through uh, something I teach, which is the play cycle, where you release something, you see, you reflect on what happens, what people's reactions are, and how you found it, whether you enjoyed it or not, and then adapt it accordingly and go again. So project by project, you're getting closer and closer to work you love doing. Now, my example would be, you know, get out of Deloitte, go start doing some consultancy at a really high rate so I've got time off, train as a psychotherapist, then the second year, while I was still training as a psychotherapist, I trained as a coach. Then I thought, well, I don't want to be a coach in the way they describe, but what the hell, I'll go do it anyway and see some clients. I saw some clients with people like Chris Wilde. It's really, I said, I only coach creative people, people who want to have creative, unconventional careers. And out of that process of doing it, I realized I don't want to be sitting in my lounge with people sitting opposite me as I did at the beginning. Um, coaching them one-to-one. -one. I want to be facilitating people, creating businesses, creating amazing things. And I've ended up with this point where, you know, since then, a book that's been translated in 22 languages and courses that I have 300, uh, in total, I think over 1,100 people have done just the 30-day challenge alone. And I do some other courses as well. I ran a live event once a month in London that got, uh, that was sell out. It ended up in the Daily Mail, um, you know, national paper over here. So I've done all sorts of remarkable things. And it really is, this is why you're really on something with the join up, join up the dots uh, idea. I just did what I felt like doing next. But, but, I, but, but with a kind of um, commercial nous. So I thought, okay, I'm doing what I love doing, but how can I make this do what I love doing in a way that people like it too. Um, I interviewed Derek Sivers, who created cdbaby.com uh, and sold it for $22 million. And uh, he just started coding it for fun. And he says, the test is there's got to be excitement on both sides. I and mean, this is a really nice description. So yes, you've got to be excited about it. Otherwise, you'll lose motivation. You'll give up when it gets tough. And other people have got to get excited. So if you keep putting your music out and people just go, mm, well, okay, that's nice. You've got to keep, you've got to, you've got to change it. You've got to play with it. You've got to get better until people are going, oh, wow, this is amazing. Can I show this to my friend? I think that's and spot the same on. Thing. 
Yeah, can I just yeah. stop you there? Because I, 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 yeah, I yeah. want to jump in. I went out for a... I, it sounds like I drink all the time. I don't. I drink <laughs> I drink rarely, and that's why when I do, the brain can't cope it. with it. Um, but that's I, a British model, isn't it? It is a British <laughs> model, yeah. We, we kind of... We binge. I don't know why. We, we don't drink, 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 and then we go a bit stupid. <laughs> but um, I went out for a beer with some people that I used to work with, and they are listening to the show. Harrison Floyd, if you're out there, and Danny Montgomery, and Tony Bird, and all these kind of people. And... All they want to do that, that night was talk about my show. And they were saying, oh, yeah, I can't get enough of it, you know. And <laughs> I, I was so energised because I, you know, basically we all like talking about ourselves. And yeah. they were really on for it. And that's all they wanted to talk about. And I remember sitting there thinking, my God, if these people who are probably should be the most critical because they're the people that have seen me where I used to be and yeah. in many forms you, you, you have to play a part until it finds its natural place, they could have gone, oh, I remember what you were like. Yeah, I know you're doing this now, but that's not the real you. They weren't at all. They were totally onto it. And now I'm getting emails and stuff and, you know, and, and listeners from Korea all coming to me. I'm so inspired by the world. I couldn't conceive of going back and doing a training course for 20 people in a boardroom <laughs> somewhere. I just think yeah. my voice is blasting out across the world. And it, it, yeah. it's astonishing. It is totally astonishing. And when you get the powerful emails, and I've had three or four recently where people have said, you have changed my life. And I've never met these yeah. people. And I kind of think... Wow, you know, with power comes great responsibility, and this, you know, Spider Man said that, and <laughs> I, I now know what he means. You know, it is, it's a global thing, and if you've got the power and the inspiration and the passion, and you love what you're doing, and all those kind of things, people generally will resonate to it, won't they? Yeah, absolutely, and and you know, it is an an amazing thing when you when you push yourself to go do something. It's a bit scary, uh, as you have done, and and as I've done, and lots of my clients do. Um, it is incredibly exciting. I, when I started Scanners Night, which is uh, I no longer run, but it was an event for people um, who are scanners, a scanner being somebody with lots of ideas, lots of interests, good at starting things, not so good at finishing them. And uh, I'd, I'd have interesting speakers, best-selling authors, all sorts of stuff. We'd do exercises in the, in the, in the meetings. This is a live event I ran for, for six years in London. And I, it started as six people in a bar. And one of them was my friend, one was a client, and one of them was a bit odd. <laughs> and uh, from there, it grew into this thing. And at one point, we had 80 people. Uh, as I said, it got national press coverage and all sorts of things. And um, and it, it seems such a simple thing to me. People would email me and say, hey, when are you going to run Scanners Night in Manchester or in Devon or in Los Angeles or in Montreal? And I thought, well... You've never. It's interesting because you know that's wonderful. It's flattering, and I was tempted to do it. We did actually set up Scanners Night in Italy, in Milan, at one point. Um, but I thought, well, why don't you start it? Why don't you start or something else that's called something else and is something different, but that's true to close to your heart? And and it's what Seth Godin says, which is um, there are very few people who are willing to stand up and start something and go, I will take I will take the stress of doing this. I will be the person who looks a prat if it doesn't work out because everything else is not that hard. Uh, getting people to turn up at an event, you know, I got good at marketing, so you can learn about marketing, but you can you can run it on meetup.com to start with and get people coming along. And as long as you've got some of your mates in the room, it won't be an empty room. So it's not that hard. But what's what's weird is that we don't want to do it because we've been trained for so many years through school to be passive and to not stand up and say, hey, I'm doing something different. I'm willing to take the rap for this. It's like keep your head down. Uh, make sure you don't um, do anything embarrassing. Make sure you don't do anything that could possibly go wrong. So if people, in order to have the kind of excitement you're getting, Dave, from doing your, your brilliant show and the kind of excitement I get from having a book out and from running massive courses and running events, you just need to have that that moment when you go, okay, I'm going to go for this and I'm going to just do one. Just think about, um, I, I, I write in my, in my second book um, that I'm working on at the moment, uh, start with one. Just do one thing. If you want to run an event, for instance, it's, it's an, it, I'm using that as an example because it's quite an easy thing to start. Um, you just go, right, I'm going to run one event. Let's think about that. Don't obsess about where it's going to go and what the branding should be and how you're going to run it in three years' time. Run one thing. If you want to write a blog, write one blog post. Um, start with one. Get it out there. Take the risk for people 
you know, saying, oh, this is rubbish. And, and 99% of the time, that doesn't happen. Our fears about what's going to happen are always far, far bigger than what really happens. I mean, when I did stand-up comedy, I did a course in London for 12 weeks. This is actually, this helped me leave Deloitte. I started doing a stand-up comedy course uh, in the months running up to leaving the course, uh, leaving the job. And it ends with a gig where you invite your friends. And so there are about 50 people in the room, probably more than that, actually, maybe 80. And you do your first ever five minutes of comedy in front of a live audience, which is quite scary, as you can imagine. And um, people would often, whenever I, I then went on to a handful of gigs and, you know, little pokey places above rooms in, in pubs and that kind of thing uh, on the beginner's circuit. Um, and people would always say to me, oh, my God, what about the hecklers? I never got heckled once uh, in my entire, I, I didn't go on that long doing comedy. But, but we imagine that heckling is going to be the bane of your life. It's going to be a nightmare. That's the thing you're terrified about. It never happened at all. <laughs> and if you get into bigger clubs and you go to the comedy store at 11 o'clock at night in, in, um, in London, you probably will get heckled at some point by some drunk group. But uh, by that point, you won't really care probably. Um, so we imagine we obsess about the, the worst thing that can happen. Someone saying you're rubbish from the audience and uh, and completely fixate on that when most of the time people are not that unpleasant in, in my experience. Your comedy, just before I send you back <laughs> in time um, oh, yeah. to prove to your mate that time travel isn't impractical because I do it every <laughs> single day on this show. And I want you to tell your yeah. mate that you've, you've discovered how time travel can be achieved with I'll just a, a that, yeah. bit of theme music. Um, you said right at the very beginning of the show, you're not a naturally confident person. But to mm. be a, a stand-up comedian, that is the ultimate get yourself out there. Was that yeah. a, a way of breaking down that barrier of making yourself more confident? Because you seem supremely confident. And the fact that you're running scanners nights and you're standing up mm. there and you're liaising across the world. Was, was that a real sort of stepping stone? Was that another dot towards the John Williams that we hear today? I think it was. I think it's quite significant. And, and I think, first of all, actually, uh, it, bravery is doing something even though you're scared. It not doing something that you don't even feel scared by. So uh, I guess in that way, I, I, I am capable of being brave even when I'm not confident. And yeah, the I think the doing the stand-up comedy course was quite pivotal. I think I felt if I do this, this is going to help me start exploring new directions. So I started doing this comedy course. Uh, and in London, it's at, at this club called The Amused Moose. And um, I did it for 12 weeks. And it ends with a showcase where everyone on the course, or 12 people, however many it was, do um, a five-minute slot. And then um, you bring along your friends and, and other people. So there is then an audience of about 80 people. So the, our very first gig was an audience in front of 80 people with, with our friends and, and everything else. In some ways, it makes it worse. Having a, I had my girlfriend there and another friend and, and a couple of other people. Um, and I was... In order to prepare for it, what I did was I stood in front of a mirror with a microphone and practiced my five minutes of material over and over again until it just became automatic. And in particular, I practiced the opening minute and the opening words. So that when I came on stage, I wouldn't be fumbling for exactly what I would say in that first sentence or two. I knew exactly how it was going to work. I knew the pacing. I actually asked a question. Um, in my opening um, line in order to be a little unconventional. Um, and I asked, I opened with a sort of slightly misleading line. I won't repeat it now, but it's, um, it was, uh, I was trying to be innovative. So I practiced that over and over again. And when it came to the night and we were, I was on second to last, I was the penultimate act. And I was fairly calm as um, all my pals on the comedy course were, were sitting around on the steps um, getting ready to do their thing or having done their thing until the moment when the presenter, Logan Murray, who runs the course, who, who's, who's written books on stand-up comedy now, um, he, he then brought up the person who I knew preceded me in the running order. And then I thought, oh, my God, I'm on next. And uh, he said the instructions were you had to go behind the curtain ready so that when the previous person finished he could introduce you and i would go on stage and at the moment i was standing behind the curtain then the terror hit and i really was very nervous indeed and uh and when the, when he did his little intro and i i went on to stage 
I couldn't see very much because the lights are so bright, they're shining in your eyes. So I couldn't, uh, fortunately, probably couldn't see my friends and my girlfriend. Um, and I, I found it was like a needle dropping into a groove. So I just went into this routine, but I practiced almost like a, I had a muscle memory because I'd done it so many times in front of the mirror. And uh, I found myself doing exactly the same mannerisms and little pauses and timings that I'd done when I practiced that had come out naturally while I was practicing, but they would now kind of embedded in me. And when I got to the end of five minutes, I'd almost been on automatic and I said something silly like, uh, um, oh, I think that's the end of my material. <laughs> and as I realized, I'd run to the end of the content I had. And I got a, a really great reaction, really good um, uh, response. And, uh, and you know, I got laughs everywhere I wanted to. So I was... Um, it's I, when I you really get the well. laughs and you don't... Because I've, I've done training courses where when mm. I, I lost my place in, in mentally, basically. I got bored with doing stuff. And so yeah. I started to entertain myself. And I remember one training course I did that basically was like a stand-up comedy routine for two hours. And the audience, well, the, the <laughs> attendees were absolutely killing themselves. But mentally, I was actually thinking, my God, I could get sacked for what I'm saying here. <laughs> but what a buzz this is. This is this yeah. is amazingly funny. And I always liked the moments when I would say something that wasn't funny, but they would laugh. And I would yeah. think, what is it about that? that that's funny I, I don't actually mm. get why and then i test it out on another audience and they would laugh again even though to me it wasn't funny so yeah. you getting them where you should get them it means that <laughs> means that you should be doing the o2 sir yeah well yes i did go on to do a few gigs i did a handful of gigs and um um and and, and quite enjoyed it but but then this is just at the time then i quit deloitte and I was starting my new consultancy career. And the thought of commuting from the BBC in West London to, to go to a West End, do a live gig, and then go home, and then we'll get up in the morning and go back out to the BBC. It was just, oh, I can't do this at the same time. So I thought, I'd concentrate on one thing at a time, um, you know, building my new career, which is what I did. And, uh, and yeah, and I still use that technique of practicing the first few words, the first couple of sentences I say when I come on stage so that... I'm not fumbling for, am I saying good evening or welcome or how are you, how are you, how is everyone doing tonight? I know exactly which one of those I'm saying because if I can get the first sentence right and know I'm saying the right thing, then everything else tends to go a lot easier. So that's one of my tips for public speaking. I do exactly the same thing. And even, even in mm. this, before we record, I will sing. And I, I've got, <laughs> a, I've got, never going to give you up by Rick Astley. I will always go for a, a oh, burst yeah. of that, and then I will do a few silly voices, and it kind of gets me into the, the sort of presenting because it is presenting on the mic. It's just yeah. a different way of doing it. Yeah. And then when I come through to you the very first time, hopefully I'm already up and I'm inspired to sort of a, to build a connection and, and make a mm. great show. So I think that's an absolute now down point. If anybody is presenting, know your first 30 seconds. And then if you've got your first 30 seconds when the yeah. nerves are at their highest, then y y you're going to, you're going to, you're going to nail it. You're, you're going to do great things. Right, yeah. Mr. Williams, just before we say goodbye to you, this is the end of the show, and this is the bit that we call the Sermon on the Mic, and this is when we send you back in time like a young Marty McFly to have a one-on-one -on -one with your younger self. And if you did go back in time, walked into the room, and the little John was there, what age John would you pick? Would it be the five-year-old? Would it be the 20-year-old? Or would it be the one, one day before Deloitte? So I'm going to play the music, <laughs> and when it fades out, you're up, and this is the Sermon on the Mic. The mic. Here we go with the best bit of the show. The sermon on the mic. The sermon on the mic. Well, this is my moment <laughs> to try and speak to you in a way that's going to teach you some of the things I've learned over the past few decades. And I think what I want to say most is that everything's going to be all right, actually. But most of the things you worry about and most of the things you're scared of are going to go wrong. Don't go wrong. Some of the things you haven't thought of do go wrong. <laughs> so there's no point worrying about any of it anyway. And um, that actually you can do pretty much, uh, you can do most of the things you want to do. Um, or pretty much anything you want to do. And the one of the things that's important that I want you to know is that if you spend too long 
trying to decide what to do when you don't get anything done. And I recommend you start reading biographies of famous, successful people you really like earlier. People like Richard Branson and Brian Eno and uh, musicians and comedians and find out how they started. Because what you'll find is that all of those people don't deliberate endlessly about what to do with their life. They go and do a project. So discover the joy of doing projects. Throw away all your ideas about careers and even about a business and what business would you start if you wanted to have a business. Instead, just think, what project do you want to do now? And don't just dabble. Actually finish something and ship it. If you want to play with your electronic music, which you love, produce an album and make sure that you do it and get other people to help you. And that brings up another point, which is other people will be more than happy to help you if you help them. So you don't have to do all this stuff on your own. And uh, you'll be able to do things that even you will be surprised by. You can go and write a best-selling book. You can go and make a six-figure business, business doing what you love. And one of the things you, uh, you need to be able to do is to be uncomfortable. So if you can stand feeling awkward and feeling and being disappointed and being knocked back and feeling incredibly embarrassed because you try to do something it doesn't work out then um, you'll be able to go and do incredible things so um, go and take a few risks enjoy yourself don't discard anything you think uh, you think of as being too frivolous or too unimportant or you're not good enough because uh, uh, if you stick at it and you actually produce things then um, you're going to have a fantastic life. That is a blueprint for success. If anyone is out there, and I know you're out there because I get so many downloads, it's untrue. You listen to those words. You, you put that on and just keep on playing those back because that is how you're going to start creating the life that you deserve. No one can help you do that. It's up to you. Take the risks one step at a time and you'll be surprised at what progress you make. John, um, just before we say goodbye to you, how mm. can people connect with you? Well, if you go to screwworkletsplay.com, and in actual fact, you'll find in Google, if you type the word screwwork, it auto-completes of Let's Play, which uh, I think my mother must be very proud of. <laughs> um, you, you can find my site, and under free stuff, uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can download. So if you enter your email address, you'll get... Um, the first chapter of my book for free you get a one hour audio class of me about how to do what you love and get paid for it and you get uh, my career DNA worksheets to help you uh, break down what it is you'd like to be doing for your work from here on in and I'll also let you know about all the programs we've got coming up the screw work Academy on how to build a six-figure business the 30-day challenge on how to uh, make an idea happen on 30 days and all the other good stuff I do so um, hope to see you over there and feel free to uh, tweet me. Um, I'm at John SW. And uh, I've also got a Screw Work Let's Play page on Facebook. So come and say hi and tell me what you thought and uh, love to connect with you. All those links will be on the show notes. So please bombard him because he has delivered so many nuggets of gold today. It's been amazing. I've loved having you on the show today, John. And thank you so much for spending time with us today, joining up those dots of your life. And please come back again when you have more dots to join up because that's the beauty of this show. Your history is going <laughs> to keep on growing. And therefore, there's more dots to follow. There's more stumbles. There's more falls. As I really believe that by joining up those dots and connecting our paths is the best way to build our futures. John Williams, thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. That's been great. David doesn't want you to become a faded version of the brilliant self you were once to become. So he's put together an amazing guide for you called the eight pieces of advice that every successful entrepreneur practices, including the two that changed his life. Head over to joinupdots.com to download this amazing guide for free, and we'll see you tomorrow on Join Up Dots.